hello, I'm David Uwe, Executive Director of the Chinese American Museum, DC. Uh, we are the first and only museum in our nation's capital dedicated to the Chinese American story. Today is our second webinar in our recent series covering Chinese Americans serving in the US military. Uh, this afternoon's program specifically covers two historical narratives in both the European and Pacific theaters of war. Um, a lot of people ask us, you know, why haven't we covered this or that? Uh, we uh, will, we would like to get to uh, every conflict and, and uh, hero out there, uh, but uh, of course, you know, we're limited by time. So uh, hopefully in the future, we can get to certain, some specific topics that you're interested in. Uh, today, we're joined by Jennifer Dubina, who's an educator at the National Museum of the United States Army in Fort Belvoir, Virginia. Uh, if you've not been to this museum, it is just a 35 minute drive from Washington, DC and uh, points there nearby. Uh, we are pleased to have with us our go-to expert on Asian Americans serving in the military, Monty Hong. He's an award-winning filmmaker and steward of rare military artifacts and personal histories of Chinese American veterans. Mani is the co-founder of the Chinese American GI Project in San Francisco. And we also have our special guest today, uh, Cecilia Gerlan, the founder and executive director of the Bataan Legacy Historical Society. Uh, she founded the organization to address the lack of information about the role of Filipinos during World War II. Uh, in the Philippines, and uh, she is out there to seek justice for the Filipino veterans whose benefits were rescinded in 1946. Um, she was inspired by her father, uh, Louis Gerlan Jr., a Filipino veteran of World War II and uh, 41st Infantry Regiment, and he's also a survivor of the Bataan Death March. So to start us off, we're going to play a four minute audio file. It, is, it does not have any moving video uh, of the 1944 NBC announcement of the D-Day invasion. Uh, it was the first time that the public had ever heard uh, that this operation was underway. So let's take you back to June 6th, 1944. And again, this is audio only. St. John in the NBC newsroom in New York. Ladies and gentlemen, we may be approaching a fateful hour. All night long, bulletins have been pouring in from Berlin claiming that D-Day is here, claiming that the invasion of Western Europe has begun. Uh, let me read you several of the latest bulletins. One says that a report, unconfirmed by allied sources, of course, says that heavy fighting is taking place between the Germans and invasion forces on the Normandy Peninsula, about 31 miles southwest of Le Havre. Another bulletin, also from Berlin Radio and unconfirmed, says the British-American landing operations against the western coast of Europe, from the sea and from the air, are stretching over the entire area between Cherbourg and Le Havre, a distance of about 60 miles. I repeat, there is no confirmation. And here's another bulletin just in. DNB, the German agency says, uh, this is unconfirmed, that the most important airdromes in the area of the Normandy Peninsula of France have been wiped out. Now, I presume that means wiped out by the Allies. Uh, as you may have heard on earlier broadcasts, all three German news agencies have begun broadcasting uh, these stories that the invasion is here. But there is no Allied confirmation as yet. The first report came out shortly after midnight, and since then we've been flooded with reports from Berlin. Paris Radio, strangely enough, has not confirmed any of these reports. Uh, and now we have just been informed that we can expect in a very few seconds, in a very few seconds, a very important broadcast 
from the British capital. And so now, we take you to London. The text of communique number one will be released to the press and radio of the United Nations in ten seconds. Repeat, ten seconds from now. Command of General Eisenhower, Allied naval forces, supported by strong air forces, began landing Allied armies this morning on the northern coast of France. The communique will be repeated. Under the command of General Eisenhower, Allied naval forces, supported by strong air forces, began landing Allied armies this morning on the northern coast of France. This ends the reading of communique number one from Supreme Headquarters, Allied Expeditionary Force. Ladies and gentlemen, this is New York, NBC Newsroom again. Men and women of the United States, this is a momentous hour in world history. This is the invasion of Hitler's Europe. The zero hour of the second front. The men of General Dwight Eisenhower are leaving their landing barges, fighting their way up the beaches into the fortress of Nazi Europe. They are moving in from the sea to attack the enemy under a mammoth cloud of fighter planes, under a ceiling of screaming shells from Allied warships. The first news flashes do not say, but a large proportion of this assault is believed to be in the hands of American men. They are making the attack side by side with the British Tommies who were bombed and blasted out of Europe at Dunkirk. Now, at this hour, they are bombing and blasting their way back again. This is the European front, once again being established in fire and blood, not only by the Americans and British, but by many allies in the fight against Axis aggression. That's, um, that, that is pretty incredible. Um, so, you know, that obviously marked a major offensive and shift in the war, but by no means was it, was it really the end of the war uh, for either theater. So in terms of, Mani, in, in terms of the history of Chinese American servicemen, you know, it, it was neither the beginning or end, but, you know, what, what was... What was the story that's not being told there? Omani, oh, you're muted. My bad, everyone. So the Chinese Americans um, obviously have a small role in D-Day because their numbers were small, but obviously they participated in the attack from the beginning to the end. Um, lives were lost, Chinese Americans were also killed, and we will also see these stories and hear about these stories today. And I think for so long, the D-Day story is one of mammoth history for the United States military. It's a single most important day, right, for this operation in the history of Americans' military. And I feel that it's, it's really kind of really in my mind, it's a blessing that we we have a few stories of Chinese Americans that serve. So let's get right into it. Um, as we start the invasion, the American paratroopers, numbered over 16,000, opened the invasion up with two groups. We have the 82nd Airborne Division and the 101st. So let's show that slide of... Um, of uh, General um, Eisenhower speaking to the 80, 101st Airborne before they took off. So we could start with that. So as we as we get into the early moments of the battle, the American paratroopers were the first to jump in and that appeared after midnight um, Pacific, excuse me, uh, British double summertime. And obviously, the battle opened with the American paratroopers going into action, and obviously, let's show let's show a clip to show people how that kind of looked like because it was crazy to know that these guys jumped. In. 
pick that out. It's been incredible to see, you know, the 16,000 paratroopers just coming down. And I'm sure the Germans were not happy to see that. Now, the first uh, men in combat were the 101st Airborne. We have Kenneth Gong of the 501st Parachute Infantry Regiment, who jumped in uh, shortly after midnight. And let's show a picture of Kenneth Gong. Um, Kenneth Gong hailed from the Mississippi Delta. He was a China native that came to America in the 1930s and basically um, entered World War II as a draft. It was drafted for World War II and decided that he wanted to really fight and he wanted to really be in a combat situation. And he found that there was no better than the paratroopers. So he volunteered for the paratroops. And, and, and Monty, where was he from? Uh, he was from Hong Kong. He, he was born in China. So he mm -hmm. was a native of China and did not receive uh, citizenship until mm -hmm. he entered the US Army. So by entering the paratroops, Obviously, he became a very tenacious fighter, and he was very good with his M3 submachine gun, was known as the Grease Gun, and they gave him the nickname of Machine Gun Gong. But, but he was living in California at the time. Uh, no, he was. He hailed from Mississippi, so Mississippi, he was from okay. Mississippi Delta. Yeah, one of the Chinese from the Mississippi Delta whose parents um, were cultivating rice farming in the Delta at that time. So yeah. obviously, he went to war became a paratrooper, uh, fought with the 101st from Normandy all the way to the end of the war to Berchtesgarden, and obviously saw a lot of combat. This is my uncle, Leon Yi, and you can see him on your screen uh, left there a uh, few days before taking off for the invasion with the 101st Airborne, uh, excuse me, 82nd Airborne, and just a shout out. I'm wearing the uniform today of an 82nd Airborne paratrooper uh, in honor of them for D-Day. And um, in his squad, this is his main group and his main buddies. And obviously, he jumped in approximately 2.40 a.m. Uh, into the dark. Um, the, the 101st jumped in first uh, as part of what they call Mission Albany. Uh, the 82nd jumped in as Mission Boston to their objectives, and he's with the 507th Parachute Infantry Regiment. And we can see here that uh, in research we found, and you can go to the next slide, David, um, we found that this is the formation of the aircraft that was going in, and that was the actual aircraft that he was on with his, quote, stick of paratroopers jumping in around approximately 2.40 a.m. Uh, for their objective. Um, go to the next slide, please. I believe it's the seaborne attack. Oh, okay. So from here, the... The 82nd fought a very hard fight. Uh, my uncle's wounded, D plus four, means four days after D-Day. He was hit in the head uh, while attacking a German machine gun position uh, at a town called Lafayette. And there was a very, very big battle there uh, between the airborne troops that was holding on for dear life and the oncoming German attack that had uh, armored vehicles and everything. And fortunately, the the Airborne was able to hold on, but it was a very, very tough fight. They also could be seen as an inspiration for the uh, uh, end of the uh, battle in Saving Private Ryan. Uh, you guys remember there was a bridge fight, paratroopers were holding on, German vehicles were coming in. That was pretty much the battle that the 507th and the other 82nd Airborne troopers had to fight. So let's take a look at... Just once a quick question, Money. Out of the, just for our audience, out of the 20,000... Chinese Americans serving uh, in World War II. How many were in the European theater? You know, I would say that out of the roughly 20,000 that served, um, I would say there was probably a good 40% that served in the European theater. Um, and that's in the Navy, right, on ships. Mm -hmm. 
Um, we haven't found actual names yet of actual sailors that were on D-Day that were Chinese, but no doubt they were aboard ships, right? Mm -hmm. They were in the Army Air Forces. We have several that actually were conducting bombing raids prior to the D-Day invasion and still flying missions thereafter. And of course, in the Army, you know, we have a ton of Chinese that served, you know, I, either in combat or support, you know, capacities. And there was um, probably one or two nurses also that were in the European theater. Mm -hmm. But primarily, they also served, of course, in the Pacific, which we will cover in part two. Um, to follow up on that, Monty, were um, uh, Chinese American troops in separate units or did they serve alongside Caucasian troops? Great question, Jen. Very important. Chinese Americans were not segregated separated during World War II, right? They did not serve in individual units like the 442nd, 100th Battalion. So that is also why the Chinese American stories are a little bit harder to get to because we were integrated mm -hmm. into the masses and therefore a bit forgotten, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let's go to the seaborne attack. I apologize. I think there's something wrong with the video's alignment. Oh, are you uh, are you able to play that, or should we just move on? Um, I think by the time I fix it, we should probably just move on. <laughs> okay. All right. On to the seaborne attack. So as the airborne opens the spearhead, um, they spearhead the invasion. So now you know we're coming upon dawn, right? You know, it's it's basically. Night is fall. Night is opening up. The paratroopers are well in. 101st Airborne, 82nd Airborne has jumped in. They're trying to get to their objectives, right? Big fight, huge fight between the Germans now. But now with the Americans landing at Omaha Beach and Utah Beach, this is the second front that's opening up right now, right? This is the main show because as the paratroopers soften up the inland, now it's just up to the seaborne troops to come in. So one of the first um, to go in, obviously, was we can go to Colonel John B. Wong. He was with the 238th Engineer Combat Battalion. He landed on Utah Beach. Here, here is the order of battle for the unit. And this is the unit uh, distinctive insignia, a very rare piece that's part of my archive uh, given to me by Colonel Wong. So Colonel Wong was also one of the rare officers who commanded, uh, obviously, a squad. And their job as combat engineers at that time was to blow up the obstacles, get the troops inland, blow up any more obstacles that are in the way, including German bunkers and everything, and then pave the road for the engineers to open it up, set up bridges, uh, um, different roads so that the air of uh, the vehicles could land, you know, the trucks, the tanks, the jeeps, getting that material ashore was vital for, um, you know, the troops. Here he is with his wife um, right before the D-Day invasion as on his last leave, and, and then a young lieutenant. And this is the first bridge that was established by Colonel Wong and his men uh, by the Douve River, which was really called the first battle bridge that was connecting the beachhead troops to the French inland. This was the first bridge um, that they established uh, and obviously it was a very important situation. But needless to say, as an engineer, he would tell me that they were in front and they were coming before some of the combat infantry troops. So they had to fight their way forward as well. So just because you're an engineer didn't mean that you didn't do any fighting. And he saw plenty of combat that day along with several casualties near him. And um, he also had to help to establish what was called a Bangalore torpedo, which is on a long two inch tube full of explosives to blow through the German uh, barbed wire and, uh, and the, the obstacles in front of them. So not only that they have to fight their way in, then they had to stop and pause and go back to their engineering duties. So um, it was a pretty incredible day for uh, Colonel Wong and his men, and obviously he fought all the way to the end of the war as a combat engineer. Let's go on to our next uh, individual. Mm -hmm. So obviously with the seaborne landing, we have two different landings. Now you're at Omaha Beach. Omaha Beach was one of the 
toughest, toughest landings that the Americans and the Allies undertook with huge casualties. And that's what you saw in the movie Saving Private Ryan. Here you have Corporal Randall Ching of the 5th Ranger Battalion. Now, the 5th Ranger Battalion was held back uh, as the 2nd Ranger Battalion landed first. They took the brunt of the fire. They took the brunt of the casualties by hitting uh, Point Du Hoc, which is the famous cliffs that they had to climb. Now, because of what was happening, luckily, his commander uh, saw that there was an opening to the right and they went for Dog White Beach and they landed there. And it was obviously still tough, but it wasn't as tough as Omaha landing. They didn't take as many casualties. He had to fight his way now back up the, the beachhead, go inland. And now they were several miles from their original objective, but they had to fight inch by inch to just get back to several miles where they were first initially needed to be at, right? So let's go to the second, um, let's go to the next uh, slide here. I'm gonna show show off. So, so obviously this is kind of how he looked on the day of after stripping down some of his gear, carrying his M1 rifle. And if obviously one of the most recent pictures, of course, getting his Legion of Honor from the French government and obviously carrying um, his combat equipment one of the things that he was cited for, which which a lot of people never see in these citations, uh, David, Jennifer, uh, Cecilia, is that he was, he was slighted, cited for killing the enemy with a knife and that he wiped out scores of Germans with a knife, which really attests to the fact that this guy was a tenacious fighter, right? A tenacious warrior. And obviously the Rangers fought very hard. They took many casualties. But uh, Randall, of course, was able to, you know, keep going forward and was never replaced from his battalion and fought all the way to the end of the war, David. I mean, it's pretty incredible, right? Now, he's cited for two Bronze Star Awards, okay? Um, and obviously, we feel that he should have been upgraded to a Silver Star because these combat, you know, excursions of his were pretty extraordinary, right, as, as a soldier for the United States Army and as a ranger. And we see him with two other generations of his family, his son, Carl, serving in Vietnam, and then obviously his nephew who served in Iraq in the Marine Corps. And um, he requested that he wanted to hold the M1 rifle one more time, that I put him in his outfit to let him feel that that how it was one more time on that day. And he said, boy, this rifle feels a little heavier than I remember. So that's kind of how he looked during his last days. And I'm really sorry to say that we lost him uh, recently. Um, and uh, I knew him very, very well. And uh, a shout out to the family for that. Was he um, was he able to participate in the uh, Congressional Gold Medal? Absolutely. Sir? Yes, absolutely. He was a Congressional Gold uh, Medal recipient. Yeah, I'm sorry I didn't get to meet him. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So let's move forward now. Now that we have um, really covered the paratroopers, we've covered the two landings from Omaha Beach, Utah Beach. Now this story really hits home to me, everyone. Um, I, I've, I've been researching this gentleman because I've known the family who hails from Hanford, California um, in the San Joaquin Valley, kind of a, a really kind of sleepy town, farming town, um, small town USA not a whole lot of Asians in this town. But here's a story of um, Harold Lee. Harold Lee um, was one of the many thousands, of course, drafted Chinese Americans, right? Um, can we put up the image? Awesome. Okay, here's his draft card. Um, he graduated from Hanford High and then obviously went into the army. But what was really interesting about knowing him is because for over 60 years, his records were lost. Um, the Army Personnel Department did not have these records initially uh, in place because somehow they were misfiled. But through his brother and myself, um, we kind of corresponded uh, and really stayed on top of this for the next 20 years. And you can forward to the next slide, please, David. And and we we see him here. This is his yearbook picture when he graduated. And by all accounts, you know, this guy was a normal American kid, um, you know, was in the basketball team. Uh, he in his senior year 
uh, joined the journalism club. And there he is in his uh, basketball team uniform for um, Hanford High. 1943, he was a graduate, right? And so he wanted to be a journalist, which was really interesting. And this is something I found out later on that he was part of the journalism um, uh, department in his senior year before he graduated. So as he graduated, um, obviously the call for war came up. Um, he had to, he was drafted and then he had to serve uh, obviously his duty, went into the army was um, assigned to the 60th Infantry Division, um, and which eventually obviously went to Normandy on the invasion. And we can go forward, please. Yep. And, um, and basically, uh, as part of the 60th, um, they did not land on D-Day. Um, they landed um, uh, several days later. And basically, they were basically part of what's called the second wave of the D-Day invasion and landing on the 9th of June. And so their uh, unit fought really hard as they were trying to break out of the beachhead because getting on the beach was one fight, but breaking through into um, the inner uh, portions of the French coast was just another fight. And that just took tremendous amounts of time. But this is a really remarkable V-mail that uh, Harold sent back to his family one week before the D-Day invasion saying that, you know, I kind of missed the USA uh, even though it's beautiful countryside on, you know, in England, but he clearly was homesick and missed home. And unfortunately, this V-mail was not, re uh, did not reach his family until after his death, which was a month later. So Harold, unfortunately, was killed in action 29 June 1944. And he was the first of his class to die to become a casualty of the Second World War. And, um, there was a reporting, as you see from the uh, local newspaper, the Sentinel, um, the family was very broken up and they had not much information to go on except that he was killed in action. So he was actually buried um, at the St. Mary Glee Cemetery with many other US soldiers and allied soldiers. And the father had written to the War Department that they wanted to send him home back to, you know, back to Hanford. They wanted him very close to home. So this process took, unfortunately, almost two years after the war had ended before the body could be brought back. But the sad part of this is the father died of stress. And um, he was very sad and depressed because obviously his number one son was not home, was killed in action and he died before Harold could come back home. Now, the closure to the story is, um, I worked with the family and the personnel department of the army, and we got a notification somewhere, uh, I wanna say 2002, and it was incredible, because the army notified that for some reason, Harold Lee's personnel records were found and they were misplaced uh, through, I believe they said it was through Fort Knox, which we have no idea how they ended up there. But the, but the matter is, is that we finally found the story behind how he was killed in action. We saw the, um, what they call the Dr Graves Registration Report. And then of course, all the papers subsequently uh, followed by the US government that afforded to send his body back home to Hanford, California. It was pretty incredible. So so there was some closure to the family, David, um, that that obviously, you know, after 60 years after D-Day, that the family finally at least got a little bit more of, of Harold. And it affected the family very, very gravely, very deeply. Uh, I should also add that the Lee brothers all served in the United States military, two others served in the army, and also a younger served in the Air Force in the Korean War, Cold War era. So I think that that pretty much kind of um, puts a cap now on a little glimpse of the Chinese Americans on the European theater on that very day of D-Day, one of the most important operations. So I think um, we can start moving into the Pacific, but let's close this out with any questions, uh, Jen or David or Cecilia, if you have any questions that we might want to um, answer for the audience about D-Day. Are, are there any cases that you know of where either the news outlets or, or maybe the military itself um, suppressed stories of Asian Americans serving in Europe? in the year because you know you don't really you really don't hear these stories obviously there's a, there's an issue with the numbers 
compared to others. But uh, have you have you ever come across any like things that it seems like they're deliberately? Uh, well, yes, I'm thinking about this, and you know, and I'm thinking about why Harold's information was kind of lost, you know, and then found 50 years later, right? Because really the family had no clue how he perished, how he died that day on 29 June. Yeah. Um, and I don't think it was so much that the War Department suppressed the information, but I think one of the issues was, you know, obviously there was so much going on at the time, especially sure. D-Day, so many casualties of all of all the allied, you know, soldiers and of course, American troops, you know, yeah, they're certainly not the only one. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And it took time for information to, you know, float through the departments from, from the command to the graves registration to the war department that, that had to make the official announcement to the family and then to the president's office where they had to receive a certificate officially saying that, you know, we, we are here to recognize your son's service, and he had he had given a great sacrifice for his nation, etc. So um, I think it was just a communication chain problem, really, and it took a lot of time. I mean, look how long it took for the family to get Harold back to Hanford, California, nearly two years, you know, after he perished. Uh, Robert Wong uh, reports that his father, who passed away in 2020, was a sailor on a PT boat that arrived on uh, D Day One. Oh wow! Great story. And then he gives he gives his contact information. We always we always come up with great leads for Monty. <laughs> Thank uh, you, Robert. Awesome man. Awesome. Thank you. Yep. Are there um, other questions or? Yeah, I think I have one. Um, one of the themes we've kind of seen through the Army's history is that oftentimes um, different groups are kept from serving in combat situations. Um, you see it a lot in World War II with Hispanic Americans and African Americans. Um, in your research, did you ever come across that with Chinese Americans? I don't think they were so much suppressed by race, um, simply because our numbers were a lot lower, right? Because I, you know, we have quite a few combatants in the European theater of operation in all services, right? But mm -hmm. I mean, there are some instances where, you know, maybe they were assigned to more of a support role. And certainly there are those that were probably qualified as infantrymen, but they were needed maybe because they were a typist, if that makes sense. And I, I have a story somewhere in my files about a Chinese American who served for a high ranking general. And he became, um, you know, kind of like an aide to the general, but he was kind of upset because he wanted to go to combat. You know, he didn't he didn't want to serve in that capacity, but you know, obviously he had no choice because you go where the army sends you, right? You know, if you if you were assigned to a support unit, you know, so be it. If you were you were going to a combat unit like Harold, well, that that was his fate, right? That was the situation. So you you have to serve your duty. So someone asked how many Chinese Americans served in World War II. So, I mean, I've seen numbers from various sources that range from 18 to 23,000. So I know that you and I've had this conversation yeah. many times, but, you know, uh, so, you know, maybe uh, the median there is 20,000, but, uh, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's you know, I've always, I've always used a number up to 20,000. I don't say 20,000 and simply mm -hmm. because I have every record from the U.S. War Department, the official records that give the breakdown by mm -hmm. race. Right. So Chinese, Japanese, Filipino, African Americans, and Eskimo, mm -hmm. for example, are listed as part of the U.S. War Department's breakdown by race. And this started yeah. back in 1940 with the draft of October 1940, our first peacetime draft. And so I have these records from October 1940 to 1947, because in 1946, even though the war was over, we were still in at, we were still in World War II, technically, right? Because we right. had the occupation of Japan and World War II. But in the official records, I can say that everything adds up to roughly 18,000 plus. Mm -hmm. And that's the official records. But, yeah. but then who knows? Because we've never seen the official records for the United States Navy, the yeah. Marine Corps, the Coast Guard, the mm -hmm. Merchant Marines. So that there were quite a few Chinese aboard ships uh, yeah. during World War II. So that's why I use that term up to 20,000, if that right, makes sense. So right. I think it's a very safe bet to and say I, that. Monty, I think you alluded to it earlier in, in a comment, but 40% uh, 
of Chinese that served in the US military were not even allowed to become citizens at the time because of the it's still the you know lingering effects of the Chinese Exclusion Act. And that represented because you know the Chinese population, because of exclusion, was relatively small still. That represented one in four Chinese in America that served. So, you know, which is considerable given that they were not even allowed citizenship at the time. So, you know, it shows uh, that that absolutely. love of country, you know, even though the country didn't always love them. Absolutely. That's yeah. that's a great point because, you know, I mean, in today's uh, presentation, we've already seen Kenneth Gong, who's an immigrant, right? Mm -hmm. We have another paratrooper coming up that's going to be uh, featured right now, um, Corporal Dale Yi with the 11th Airborne, um, who jumped into Los Banos and Taguete Ridge in the Philippines. And again, he is just like, um, you know, um, you know, all these other guys of 40% plus that were immigrants coming into the late 1930s, were not citizens of the United States and did not become a citizen until they joined the army, right? Mm -hmm. So they, they were afforded citizenship as part of their service. And I think that's still a, a really important point because mm -hmm. a lot of people don't realize that, um, you know, 40%, that's nearly half of the Chinese in America weren't American citizens at that time, but they still fought for their country. Well, we certainly won't be able to get to everyone's comments in here, but um, I'm gonna give the transcript to Monty because I think there are a lot of things, a lot of uh, interesting people to follow up on, people talking about their um, fathers, uncles, the mothers, et cetera. Um, yes. should, we, yeah. should we keep yeah, going? Let's, the, let's yeah. take everyone over to the Pacific right now, okay? We're gonna go to the Pacific, 1945. Cecilia, I think you and I here, we've talked about this so many times here. So let's bring this in because um, the start of the, the Corregidor video. Yes, the start of the Pacific War was not a very happy time for Americans. And it was a site of one of the worst defeats in United States military history. And let's get right into it. Um, we have a little bit that I'd like to play. This is actually the last broadcast um, that came from Corregidor. They are not near yet. We are waiting for God only knows what. How about a chocolate soda? Not many. Not near yet. Lots of heavy fighting going on. We've only got about one hour, 20 minutes before We may have to give up by noon. We don't know yet. They are throwing men and shells at us, and we may not be able to stand it. They have been shelling us faster than you can count. We've got about 55 minutes, and I feel sick at my stomach. I am really low down. They are around now, smashing rifles. They bring in the wounded every minute. It is a horrible sight. We will be waiting for you guys to help. This is the only thing, I guess, that can be done. General Wainwright is the right guy, and we are willing to go on for him but shells were dropping all night, faster than hell. Damage terrific, too much for guys to take. Enemy heavy cross shelling and bombing. They have got us all around and from skies. Wow, man. Whew. So some of that language is a little unusual. Are they, is, are they trying to speak a little in code, like chocolate soda? Is there? Yeah. So this is a this is a very extraordinary uh, piece of communique because it was uh, sent by Morse code and picked up by several stations at the time when uh, Corregidor in on May six when they were falling, and the uh, radio operator who was in the army, uh, a Corporal Irving Strobing, was sending the final message as they were waiting for 
the inevitable, inevitable, right? They didn't know the surrender was going to happen because they were still trying to figure it out at that time. So it was a desperate battle ensuing outside. And what, what really kind of closed this off was they heard that there was several Japanese tanks at the mouth of the Malinta Tunnel, and there were thousands of American wounded uh, inside the tunnel. So once those tanks broke through, it was the end. And so they decided to quickly surrender uh, at that point. They, they gave up because there was just no human way that they could go on. And, and that was, again, if, you know, for people that to think about it back then, to hear this broadcast, you know, to, to, there was no, there's no TV, there's no internet. To hear this last transmission from an American soldier on Corregidor is just, I, I mean, I, 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 got, I got goosebumps right now, you know, thinking mm -hmm. about it. Because you, you just can't imagine how difficult it was. And Cecilia, I'm, I'm sure you can attest to that, you know, because Filipinos and Americans were side by side there. And it was terrific damage on, on both sides for these men. And it was horrible. And, um, and, and oftentimes we don't get to talk about this this much, to be honest, we don't, we don't see this part of the war that often, you know, and like I said, it was a major defeat for the American uh, military. And obviously, um, it set the stage for MacArthur to get into his famous, you know, I shall return, right, because he escaped by PT boat out of Korea to, to Australia. And uh, Cecilia, why don't you comment a little bit about the, the fall of Bataan in and uh, Corregidor. Yes, so um, so it, it it was the biggest single surrender in military history. But what is not known is its uh, bigger significance, which is they held Bataan for ninety nine days, despite suffering from massive disease, starvation and fighting without any air support because air support was virtually wiped out after the first week of the war and these men were put in half they were put on half rations as early as january 5 because what happened was general macarthur changed uh, war plan orange 3 they were supposed war plan orange 3 was predicated upon the premise that the soldiers would wait uh, in the Bataan Peninsula because that was the peninsula that guarded the mouth of Manila Bay. So they were supposed to uh, defend Manila Bay so that the uh, Japanese would not capture the capital of Manila. But what MacArthur did in September was he obtained permission from the War Department to spread the troops on the beaches of Luzon because he thought that holding out in Bataan was a defeatist plan. And by doing that, Bataan was not fortified so that upon the uh, successful landing of General Homa on December 22nd, uh, by December 24th, General MacArthur reversed the war plan and reversed uh, his plan and instead, uh, went to Bataan. He ordered them to immediately retreat to Bataan and troops were coming in from the north, the south, the east, the west. There was only one road leading to Bataan. And so that's why the troops uh, didn't have enough uh, supplies in Bataan. As I said, January 5, they were already on half rations. February, there was no longer uh, any medication, no quinine for soldiers on the field. By March, they were on quarter rations. Uh, and in, in the meantime, uh, by March, there were fresh Japanese troops coming in. And then by beginning of April, there were no longer any reserve troops. And I want to add, too, that, you know, when I was uh, growing up, you know, I thought most of the troops in the Philippines were Americans, but in actuality, seven eighths of the main line of resistance were Filipinos. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there were only about 19,000 Americans. And then most of the officers of the Philippine scouts, which was under the U.S. Army, um, they were mostly Americans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Talk about the, I know there's a special relationship between um, the, the Philippine government or Philippine popula Filipino population uh, yes. and the U.S. Navy. Um, yes. There's always been that special relationship. 
So, uh, as you know, the Philippines was uh, became a colony of the United States in 1898 after the Spanish-American War. So in 1901, President William McKinley uh, signed the uh, um, executive order creating the insular force uh, of the Philippines. So um, the U.S. Navy, the U.S. Army, they were able to recruit Filipinos from the Philippines to serve in both the Army, the Army mainly in the Philippines, but the Navy, a lot of um, uh, Filipinos served um, in the Navy, not just in the Pacific area, but also uh, in the United States, like uh, Telesforo Trinidad, who um, there was a ship, I worked on a campaign to uh, name a ship, the first US Navy ship named after a Filipino who served in the US Armed Forces. That just happened last year. So he received the Medal of Honor during peacetime in 1915 when the boat uh, he was serving on the USS San Diego, the two boilers exploded and uh, he was able to save some of his uh, shipmates. It's incredible, right? Um, so this is part of that, that history that Cecilia alludes to that isn't really talked about um, or is shown as these Filipinos that were serving um, not all their stories get towed, uh, and obviously the focus, they're secondary. So, so I think that, you know, with the fall of the Philippines, as we've just saw, and the fact that, you know, now we had to have this comeback, and MacArthur really doesn't come back until October of 1944, uh, in his famous Leyte landing. Um, so, you know, this is the start of the return and the liberation of the Philippines, right? But this was a this was also a very hard fight because the the Japanese were very well embedded. Um, there were many Japanese troops in the Philippines. And then moving forward, you know, obviously it was a very inch by inch fight. Now as we get into today's um topic about the prison raid at Los Banos, there was on the same day, the 23rd of February, 1945, it was this event at the flag raising of Mount Suribachi on Iwo Jima with the Marine Corps that overshadowed the Los Banos raid. Because obviously this beautiful photograph, which is one of the most iconic US military photographs taken by Joe Rosenthal. Hello, this obviously made the headlines all over the world and it still does, right? And it's one of the iconic, most iconic images of the Second World War. And because of this operation at Iwo Jima, the Los Banos prison raid was kind of swept aside, if that makes sense, right? And went into history. Although, although there is quite a bit of stories and books, et cetera, being told about it, but obviously not as popular as the Iwo Jima battle, right? So let's move forward here. Let's start with our operation. So this is the Los Banos prison. And um, we were talking about the Sicilia and about how, you know, there were over 2000 prisoners, internees that were civilian that were moved here. But the fact that Cecilia, we were talking about how large this prison was, right? Because it was so much larger than the other uh, prisons like San Tomas and everything. And this place was huge. I mean, look look at this place to hold 2,000 uh, prisoners. And if you want to say something about this too, <laughs> please, um, Cecilia, this is really- so, um, Yes, this was uh, originally, well, it still is part of the University of the Philippines Agricultural College. And so, uh, so uh, some of the prisoners uh, were transferred to uh, Los Baños, I think beginning 1943. And then, um, and so, yeah, it was huge. It, uh, and it held not just Americans, but other uh, nationalities as well. Correct. Was it, Correct. A, was it a labor camp or was it strictly to just- detain? Civilian, strictly civilian POWs. Right, mm -hmm. right. So they weren't required to do the type of uh, forced labor like some of the other allied prisoners under Japanese, um, you know, rule. No. Uh, they, they, but they had, but obviously they had to, you know, do their own share of work because they had to grow their own food, 
et cetera. Um, you know, life wasn't a piece of cake for them either, right? Because you're you're still under Imperial Japanese rule. Mm -hmm. And 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 let's move forward, David. So and this, and this photo, this photo is is at that time. This isn't a more recent photo. No, this is a photo photo that I enhanced. Um, had Ron Chan help us with the um, enhancement of this to digitize mm -hmm. the photo to make it a, a little bit more sharper and clearer mm -hmm. to show the massive compound that they had. And and so, as the war was winding down, right, we're in February of 1945. You know, a uh, uh, massive amount of civilians were obviously moved here, and you can see this one particular. I believe he was a professor and obviously had a Filipino wife and had mixed children, right? So many people like himself and the families with children were housed and put into this prison, and obviously. The Japanese, uh, Cecilia, right, we were discussing this, they were getting tired of taking care of all these prisoners because it requires a lot of manpower, rations, food, et cetera, supplies. I really, the one of the things that's very tragic was the thought was, I think we're going to get rid of all these people. And that was the thinking of the Japanese Imperial um, Command was that, you know, at some point better just get rid of them get rid of them, eliminate them, and then we move on, right? So the uh, high command, U.S. high command in the Philippines obviously got word. Uh, MacArthur was very, General MacArthur was very concerned about this and asked for um, focus on liberating American POW prisoners, which from other prisons, which I'll let um, Cecilia mention. And then, of course, the Los Banos raid was needed because of the massive amount of civilians in here, including uh, Americans. Um, so, Cecilia, why don't you, why don't you um, talk about that a little bit in terms of that outlook on, and the situation with the prisons in the Philippines yes. at that time? So, you know, after the um, later landing, the, the Japanese started tightening their grip uh, not just on the uh, military uh, POWs, but on the civilians, so that they started uh, giving less rations. And, you know, towards the end, they were, I mean, a lot of them lost so much weight because of starvation. They, they were starving. They starved them. And so, um, and also they started um, implementing uh, zonification. Zonification was when the Japanese uh, army, led by the Kempei Tai, the military police, would go into uh, these towns to round up um, men over 15 and over, and also women who were suspected of sympathizing or aiding the Americans or the guerrillas. They would zone the towns. Usually the selection process would take inside the church, and then they would uh, take those selected, usually with the help of um, collaborators, Filipino collaborators called makapilis. Uh, they would wear these uh, baskets over their heads and you could just see their eyes. They would, uh, uh, their eyes. And then they would point at suspected, um, you know, sympathizers. And then these people would be taken uh, usually near a cemetery to a cemetery and, and subsequently executed. So this uh, started around uh, November after the landing, they started doing this more frequently. This mm. had happened before, but the, the uh, frequency became, it became more frequent after the later landing. And so also, if you know that there was a massacre that took place in Palawan, uh, 150 prisoners were forced to go into a dugout. There was a, there was a siren that sounded off. They were forced into a dugout. The uh, entrances were doused with gasoline and uh, they were burned. Only 11, 11 soldiers uh, escaped or survived out of the 150. And this was in Palawan. These were American prisoners of war. It happened, I think, in December for, on December 14, 1944. Um, just as the Americans were going into Mindoro, which was just, uh, Mindoro is just north of Palawan, mm -hmm. just a few, several miles from, uh, 
from uh, Palawan, and that's what happened to them. So they started doing this process of, um, well, massacre. So, um, so um, in the meantime, in uh, in the area around Los Banos, they started doing the zonifications. I think beginning of February, mm -hmm. because there was a massacre, a massive massacre that happened in Calamba, which was uh, the next town in Los Banos. Right. So, right. so th this was happening a lot, uh, and especially, you know, I I did not realize it until much later because in the in the provinces of Laguna where Los Banos is and Batangas adjacent to it and Cavite these three uh, adjacent provinces there were a lot there was a lot of um, massacres and it turned out that a lot of the pilots who were down American pilots the rendezvous point for the pickup was in Lake Taal in 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 the province of Batangas, which is uh, just a few towns away from Los Banos, mm -hmm. and these towns were heavily decimated because they protected they protected these American pilots uh, to the detriment of the civilians because the civilians were the ones who suffered the most. Mm -hmm. But you can see how desperate the situation uh, became, David Jen, right? Um, the, the civilians were on their way to be slaughtered. Um, that was part of, I really think, part of the Japanese plan because there was no way that they had the capacity to still, you know, hold these prisons, et cetera, with the oncoming Allied troops. And so Los Banos became a prime focal point. Uh, into creating a rescue mission. And so U.S. High Command um, obviously uh, drew up plans and selected the 11th Airborne Division under uh, uh, Major General Joe Swing. Joe Swing. They, they formulated this plan and said, okay, we got to get in there. We got to somehow rescue all these civilians and get <clears throat> them the heck out of there, right? And that, that was really the mission for Los Banos, right? So it, it was kind of record speed that everything was drawn up. And obviously, um, there was no room for error. And the idea was kind of a several prong plan of attack where you have the provisional recon battalion going in first uh, with along with Filipino guerrillas to neutralize the guards on the perimeters, etc., to get all that going almost as a diversionary while the airborne then comes in at 7 a.m. 7 jumping at low altitude and then combined their, their mission was to wipe out all the Japanese guards in there. I mean, every one of them and then get the civilians on to the Amtrak amphibious vehicles, which were coming in 54 of them to rescue them and take them across Laguna de Bay to safety, right? And then finally, out of all of this, you have to understand there were 10,000 Japanese troops very close by. And Cecilia, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe it was within a day's march, right, to Los Banos, the Japanese, that's how close they that's were. Right. Yeah. So that if this failed, they would have been in big trouble, right? And, the, and there was a diversionary attack um, that, that basically held the Japanese back by another unit of artillery and glider troops to kind of allow the main element of the civilians and everyone to get out. And, and again, this was done in record time. Uh, it was an amazing operation because there were basically no very little casualties to the United States um, paratroopers, et cetera, uh, uh, the forces. And then uh, I don't believe there were any casualties for the civilians, except for maybe getting some scratches and bruises and bumps. But they were able to rescue over 2000 civilians in a matter of a number of hours and got them out of the prison. So let's take a look at the next slide and we'll introduce Dale Yi from B Company, 511th Parachute Infantry Regiment, who was one of the attackers that jumped into the fight. So Dale, whom I had known, the pleasure of knowing for many years, um, tough guy, um, hailed from originally a native son of Hong Kong coming to California, and then eventually um, became an American kid growing up in California, decided that he wanted to be a pilot, but 
while going through pilot training school and a, uh, aviation school, they decided not to send him to the next step to be a pilot because their answer was, we have too many pilots now, but we need more navigators and we need more crewmen. So he said, forget that. Because he said, I wanted my wings. So he got another set of wings. He jumped into the airborne, right? He got into the airborne. So he became a 511B company guy with the 11th Airborne. Now, here's Terry Santos, uh, Filipino-American from Hawaii. And, you know, as you know, Cecilia, this is one of our favorite stories because this guy was a very tenacious combat infantryman, right? Not only did he volunteer for the Alamo Scouts, which were the early forerunners of U.S. Special Forces, but he also went through paratroop training with the 11th Airborne. So his unit um, the night before uh, with the Provisional Recon Battalion, they were also known as a ghost battalion because not much was known about them and they weren't really officialized on paper, right? They were given orders to get into action with Filipino guerrillas, link up with them, and then get into the prison area before 7 a.m. And they did this within 24 hours and reach your objective on time and start at the attack. So Dale came in second. Um, Terry came in first with the recon battalion and they eliminated the guards on the perimeter. We can move forward, David, uh, and show the images. Um, their, their objective obviously was to get in, start the fight, and then the airborne came in right at 7 a.m. thereafter. And this was, again, uh, what turned out to be General Colin Powell calls this a textbook airborne operation for the United States Army and all armies of all ages. So let's move forward to the next slide, please. And so, so Dale, of course, is jumping in. And one of the things he told me as they were neutralizing the guards, one of the things that he did tell me towards the end was, he let one person go because he could not identify if the person was Filipino or Japanese because they had no military uniform on. They looked to have what was civilian clothes and they had no helmet, no weapon. So he felt relieved because he said he could not live with himself if he had shot a civilian or, or, or one of the internees. So let's move to the next slide, please. So we talk about citizenship. This is very important. Here's his diary during training camp, 1943. And it says on the bottom, sworn in as a citizen. So he became a citizen while serving in the United States Army and while he was in training camp. And here's his um, dog tag and his original jump wings um, that he um, gave me for posterity, obviously. So really, really happy that we have a piece of evidence like that, his diary that shows that he was sworn in as a United States citizen during training camp. So cool. So cool. Let's move forward, please. So here is the one of his patches that he never used from the 511th um, Angels. He's very proud of this. And this was part of the uh, airborne insignia of their unit. Next slide, please. And this picture is kind of remarkable because this is the men getting ready for the jump. Um, and this is obviously the 11th Airborne Division. But this gentleman to your screen right, as everyone's seeing with his head down, Dale believes that is him. And I have no way to, <laughs> to definitely you know ID that, but it definitely doesn't look like a Caucasian dude. And you know, I think it could be Dale. So he he tells me that he believes that was him. Terry Santos, of course, uh, as 11th Airborne with the Recon Battalion, comes in early with the Filipino scouts, the Filipino guerrillas, and they fight very, very fiercely in the beginning opening stages of the Los Banos raid. Let's go to the next slide, please. Here's the Alamo Scouts patch that he is a member of, and he went through Alamo Scouts training earlier. Uh, 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 on top of airborne training. And here's an unofficial recon battalion patch from the uh, 11th Airborne for the provisional recon ghost battalion, okay? And let's go to the next one, please. Okay, so given an idea, this is kind of how the raiding force looked like, especially with uh, Terry coming in, right? Um, Cecilia, you know, they were running very light 
uh, weight with their ammunition weapons because they had to move quickly. Um, no one wore helmets. They wore soft fatigue caps, as you see there. And obviously, on opening stages, they brought in the Filipino counterparts to fight with them at the opening of the battle. And then hence, we're at the battle in these renderings, which unfortunately, no photographs were taken of the battle. But here's the recon uh, platoon, obviously, starting off. And if you can see on top, the paratroopers are starting to drop. But that gives you an idea of how quickly they were moving. And they had the element of surprise because all the Japanese guards that they figured out were doing calisthenics at this time and they stacked their rifles. So they were easy picking, so to speak, for the raiding force. And here's the Filipino guerrillas in action, eliminating the Japanese guards while the paratroopers are dropping from the backdrop in the background. And here they go, going in. And do we have a video um, that we can show um, uh, to give an idea of the rare footage of the, right after the Los Banos raid, there was a black and white, um, uh, photography taken from one of the guys uh, on a 60 millimeter camera. So this gives an idea of the operation, some of the civilian rescues, but, but, but of course the key moment was let's get the civilians out. And Cecilia, you know, there was a massive confusion, right? For the civilians, because some of these civilians they didn't, didn't want to leave. Yeah. yeah they, they didn't want, want to leave. Afraid. They didn't know what to do. They were scared, you know, and many of the civilians had their belongings, like maybe two or three, you know, um, uh, 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 their luggage chests or whatever they were carrying. And then I remember Dale talking about, no, let's go. And he he actually made some of these civilians leave their stuff because they really had to get out of there. And it took hours to round up the civilians, if you can imagine, because it's over 2,000 people. So here's some video. Um, there's no sound here, but I'll give a... Um, commentary of some of the th this is a very rare footage because this um cecilia i believe is the wow. rating force of the recon platoon leaving because I'll, don't forget they came on on some of the bunker boats too mm -hmm. yes and i believe this is part of the recon platoon guys um going in and look look at this they are now approaching the prison with the philippine gorillas so all this was just minutes after the drop and getting the civilians out. I mean, unbelievable footage that you can see here of how many um, you know, soldiers there were. And then of course, with the civilians, there was just a ton of people that needed help. And there was also civilians, right? Cecilia, that were sick and needed oh, yes. to move. Mm -hmm. Um, we were being starved, yeah, as I yes. said earlier, yeah. And I think they said that something like 30% of civilians really were were not in great shape, yes. but a lot of them moved in their own power because they were so excited to Cecilia, see. Cecilia, you, you mentioned earlier, how, how, how many days were most of the, the um, people inside Los Banos there for? Oh, some of them, I think the first ones were in, uh, transferred from Santo Tomas, uh, University prison camp in Manila, I think in November, um, in 1943. Yes. I'll just put a plug in that my father went to University of Santo Tomas. Oh, he did? <laughs> oh, wait, are you Filipino? <laughs> I'm, I'm Chinese by way of the Philippines. <laughs> okay. Yes, yes. Uh-huh. So we can see here, you know, obviously with the civilians leaving and whatnot, it was chaotic, right? I mean, so difficult. I mean, several hundred Americans moving over 2,000 civilians, right? I mean, it's it's incredible how they were able to do this um, in a couple of hours, you know, and, and still getting everyone out, right? Um, it's still able to eliminate all the Japanese that were there. And then, of course, you know, waiting for the landing craft as you could see coming in. And then now it's, we gotta go, you know, because don't forget there was still uh, an attacking force of over 10,000 Japanese troops that was just a day's march away. So they had this element of surprise, but yet time was against them. So they had to move quickly to move out all the civilians. And amazingly, they did their job, right? It was, it was a good operation. It was very positive. They completely, you know, fulfilled the operation mission accomplished. But, but you know, the second part of this story Cecilia is going to talk about is not all, you know, glamour, so to speak, right? This is, there, there's a lot of things that I think have not been talked about because there was a lot of reprisals by the Japanese because of this. So I'm going to let Cecilia get into this as we're, as our time, I don't want to hold up everyone as we're running low on time. 
So Sila, please go ahead and start that. Yes, so after the uh, American troops left, the uh, Japanese troops, of course, came back and retaliated on the uh, civilians of Los Banos. Uh, the local um, uh, guerrilla group, the uh, PQOG or President Quezon's own guerrillas, they were actually one of the guerrilla groups that uh, took part in the rescue. There were several, uh, the Hunters guerrilla groups, PQOG, the Wachi, which was a, a Chinese uh, guerrilla group. And a lot of them actually were from mainland China. Uh, the Mark Kings, uh, uh, several guerrilla groups that, that uh, laid the foundation. So even before the reconnaissance battalion came in, they were already planning this. And it took uh, this guy named uh, Major Jay Vanderpool, who was the one who coordinated these groups because previous to that, a lot of them were not getting along with each other. Um, oh, is this Jay Vanderpool? That's the young Jay Vanderpool. Yeah, the young Jay Vanderpool, <laughs> okay. So, and Jay Vanderpool actually came in uh, in November of 1944 to make contact with uh, the guerrilla um, uh, Anderson, Bernard Anderson. And uh, so he was able to coordinate, he was MacArthur's uh, basically guerrilla coordinator to prepare for the, uh, the, the liberation of Luzon, you know, the Lingayen landing. So uh, these are, um, what, what picture is this one, Monty? These are just troops of the 25th linking up with the Filipino guerrillas here down, you know, after the um, invade, the, the retaking of the Philippines, I should say, after the Leyte landing. So yeah. and then we should probably give just a quick warning that some of the following slides showing the civilian casualties are, are a little graphic, so. Right. Yeah, I think I think it was kind of necessary to show this, um, Cecilia. Yes. So we apologize if it's a yes. little practical, but oh. but you 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 see the brutality with the Japanese and so many civilians in the Philippines were casualties of war. Um, oh. It's very sad, but that was a very brutal part of the recapture and retaking of the Philippines, especially for the in uh, later the Battle of Manila. Yes, the, the Battle of Manila took place between February and uh, March of uh, 1945, and about 100,000 civilians were killed, basically half half, half massacre and half shelling. Yes. Yeah, uh, and so that that's why the rescue of Los Banos uh, was planned uh, hastily because uh, they had already rescued the prisoners uh, in Los uh, in Santo Tomas on February three. Uh, so Los Banos. So after the uh, the troops left with the Allied and American prisoners of war, the Japanese came back and slaughtered about fifteen hundred civilians. Mm -hmm. And then this zonification took place, as I said, in uh, adjacent towns in Lipabatangas, I think towards the end of February as well, uh, mm -hmm. about almost 3,000, 2,890 civilians were mm -hmm. slaughtered. So, so there was a lot of, uh, of massacre going on. And mm -hmm. if you think about it, after the end, you know, towards the end of the war, approximately a million Filipino civilians uh, died in, in the Philippines. So, um, and so see, I want to add, like, you know, not that I, 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 I really don't like talking about this gentleman. I mean, this guy was really one of the monsters and the architects, you know, during the, the end of the Philippines campaign. I mean, this is Colonel Fujishige. I mean, you know, yes. we, we both know how brutal he was and the fact that he ordered um, many civilians to be killed. Mm -hmm. His whole thing was really about process of elimination and the fact that they were able to capture him and try him is some minor miracle. And if we can go to the next slide, um, David, right, this was the only mention of him in an American newspaper in the state side that said that he was captured with a bunch of Japanese and finally hanged. So, so there was some light at the end of the tunnel, obviously, but the fact that, you know, under his command, because mm -hmm. he was an old China war veteran from the mm -hmm. Sino-Japanese War, they mm -hmm. had instilled these sort of 
you know, the more we kill, the better, right? You know, yes. um, let, let's oh. wipe out, let's wipe them all out. You know, that's the better thing, you know, so. It, so It was actually a methodology that was developed after the 1932 Mukden incident. So the Kwantung army uh, developed that methodology of, um, you know, uh, disposing of insurgents on the spot. There was no trial. And which, uh, which happened, uh, as you know, in, in Nanking, in, in Shanghai, and, and the rest of Asia. It wasn't just in the Philippines or China. It happened all over because it was a policy. You know, a, a long time ago, uh, the Battle of Manila, they blamed it on this uh, admiral, uh, rear admiral in the Navy, Japanese rear admiral, Sanjay Iwabuchi. And they said, oh, he went amok. And he uh, he massacred everyone, but it was actually a policy. It was not uh, one person or several persons, um, you know, uh, showing impunity. But it was a military policy, and there were uh, uh, memorandums that were found, um, you know, with with these orders. Right, right. But you know, looking back here, especially in the Pacific War, you could see that there was such a clear. Um, delineation of how the war was fought, right? You know, um, it, it was, I mean, the, the Philippines campaign, especially towards the end of the war, um, was that, you know, obviously we had supremacy of air, we had more troops, we had more supplies and stuff, but the, the, but the hand-to-hand -hand combat, the yes. village to village, door to door, city to city was just brutal. And so I, I feel that in some ways, um, it's great that we have a, a, an opportunity to kind of tell the story a little bit today with an amazing American airborne operation that saved the lives of over 2,000 civilians. And um, we were actually trying to bring on one of the survivors um, to the show. Um, and unfortunately, we didn't have enough time to organize this. But, mm -hmm. but you know, I think we're going to try to do that again, Cecilia, you know, for yes. the future that we get one of the survivors from actually the prison when they were children. Mm -hmm. And they could kind of still recollect, you know, with us. Um, David, do we have another slide to end no, we're this? At, we're, okay. we're out of slides except for our, our organizational logos okay. and websites. But well, yes, I just we're out of time. I, I, you know, as always, I, I've learned a lot. And uh, I really appreciate the work that all three of you do to, you know, keep these military histories, you know, and some of them are better known than others. Some of them are very obscure and some of them are really untold. And, uh, you know, it's just a really important part. I mean, regardless of whether you're even talking about Asian American stories, I mean, these are, are, are great heroic moments and heroic people in our history and, um, and also horrific, parts of history that, you know, we need to keep telling those histories. So uh, right. I really appreciate uh, Cecilia. I really appreciate Thank you. your organization's work and, and Jen, you know, you've, um, you're continuing to tell the army's history, which, you know, is sometimes just sort of uh, reduced to, you know, movies and, you know, there's a lot of real in-depth history and stories, you know, that are not just war stories. They're, you know, stories about, sort of an American spirit that I think we don't necessarily uh, always talk about. So, and Monty, as always, <laughs> I just wealth of information. For the audience, um, I want to give a shout out to the fact that our oldest Chinese American veteran at 110 years old had just passed away. And wow. that is our illustrious pilot, Moon Fun Chin. Mr. Chin, uh, God bless. Uh, I had the honor to meet him and interview him. He flew in the China Burma India Theater with the Chinese National Aviation Corporation and then subsequently transferred over to the 14th Air Force to fly supplies over the hump. Mm -hmm. He was 110. Wow. Mm -hmm. wow. Shout out to the family. Yeah, you know, I think Mani, Mani does a lot of work collecting these oral and video histories, or, you know, a lot of them he does in person. But, you know, I think if you, speaking to the audience, if you have, uh, people in your family, regardless of their heritage, that have these histories. You know, not all veterans want to talk about their their service history, but if you could get them to, to share, you know, it, it's take, take an oral history, write down a written history, because, you know, at some point, um, you know, someone needs to continue to tell, tell them, you know, what happened and, and what their contributions were. 
Definitely. Let me, let me put up this logo slide while we're talking. Okay. And I was just going to mention the backdrop, backdrop that I have, which people can see. Um, the backdrop uh, represents our Chinese American War Memorial located at St. Mary's Park in San Francisco and is for the uh, remembrance of the fallen Chinese Americans from World War I and II, which was established uh, during the Korean War. And this memorial is really the only one of its kind in America. Mm -hmm. um, and this is an official uh, memorial supported by, you know, the U.S. government, the, the city of San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And um, this was recently refurbished. So we re-Christianed it along with um, our fallen ranger from uh, the 5th Ranger Battalion, Randall Ching, who basically opened up the ceremony and laid the wreath, you know, at the ceremony. So I felt it was kind of like a, a way for us to close out uh, Asian American mm -hmm. History Month and also Memorial Absolutely. Day. Uh, for May, um, to remember all of our Americans that gave their lives to this country that still serve today. And a shout out to my wife who's overseas right now. So she's serving in the right. Pacific. So um, it's a great thing. So this is great, David. Um, yeah, this, so this is, these are our websites, including Cecilia's website, batonlegacy.org. Uh, Baton is with two A's. Um, and um, and everybody that registered for this event will uh, eventually get a link to the recording. And so, you know, feel free to share that. It's be on our YouTube channel. Uh, share that with uh, people that may have missed this event. And uh, we look David, forward we, to David, do we have time for one more question from the audience or something just to close out? Or, you know, um, is there one or, uh, Jen, is there another question? Maybe we should provide one more before we close out the show. Hello. There are so many wonderful um, comments in the chat of people just sharing their family stories of service. So thank you for all of those. They've been great to read as they're coming in. Um, trying to find one that would be a good app. One, someone did ask how many Filipino soldiers participate mm -hmm. in the Pacific theater. So, I mean, in total. You know, not necessarily even in Las Banas. Do you know well, that? You know, just I know about the Philippines because I think there were 110,000 uh, from the Philippine Commonwealth, 12,000 mm. from the Philippine Scouts who were mostly Filipinos, and 19,000 Americans. So that was the breakdown in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Jen, Someone did you about the one? chocolate soda. <laughs> Do you have any cool question that we could uh, share there? Um, I guess one question that keeps coming to mind is how do you collect all of these stories? Um, there's a lot of comments about how people can get in contact with you and share some of their stories. Yeah, so we're we're going to be, since we're partnered with the Chinese Historical Society of America, CHSA, are the in San Francisco. Board, right, in San Francisco, and we're partnered with David at CAM DC. So the idea is that... Um, I'm going to try to establish a more permanent foundation so that we can have these stories um, shared by not only digital uh, means, but we would love to have a permanent place where uh, I can't even tell you, Jen, how many artifacts that I own um, in my collection on Chinese Americans, and I think my wife would be really happy if I got them out of the out of the house. <laughs> so. Um, but I, but I, I feel like in the future, we need a repository and a, and a permanent place to be able to share these stories. But at the same time, I'm not stopping on capturing these stories because I want to make this clear to the audience that this is also not just only about the Civil War to World War II. We're capturing stories about Iraq, Afghanistan veterans, right? We're talking about Desert Storm. We're talking about Vietnam. And of course, coming up, we have the Korean War. So we want to encompass the whole line of history, starting from the Civil War of 1861 all the way to present day. And we just feel that, you know, bottom line is we are part of this country. We're part of the American flag. We're very proud to serve. We've sacrificed. We've done our duty. 
And now it's there, there needs to be a place that you can share these stories for family and students um, of the history. And I think it's really important to understand that we have something to pass on to the generations to let them know that we served our country very proudly, right? We're part of America. So, so that kind of answers it, Jen. Um, I'm in trouble because I'm running out of room. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you. As someone, many people are thirsty for these stories and to learn more. So thanks for sharing that. I think all three of our organizations have ways for you to learn more about these stories um, by visiting all our websites. Absolutely. Um, can, can I also add that uh, California, uh, one of our biggest projects is the inclusion of World War II in the Philippines in the grade 11 U.S. history uh, curriculum framework for California. Mm. Right. So that was approved in 2016. So if there's anyone out there in grade 11 or who will be in grade 11, please ask your teachers, uh, are you going to teach us about the war in the Philippines? <laughs> because yeah. part of uh, chapter 16. Uh, and actually, because California is one of the two largest consumers of textbooks, uh, in addition to Texas, uh, any changes in these two states' curriculum framework the publishers are obligated to include them in their textbooks, to mm -hmm. reprint the textbooks. And these textbooks are distributed nationally. So it's, it's in the textbooks across mm -hmm. the country. Well, thank you to everyone uh, you, and everyone that joined us. And uh, I, I hope we can come up with a new, we're gonna, we're gonna twist Jen's arm and do a, a third <laughs> webinar soon. I would love to. <laughs> we'll do a letter writing campaign. <laughs> all right. Well, thank, thank you, guys. You thank you for joining us, yeah. everyone. Well, thank Take you care. so much. Thank you to all of you. Take care. Take care.